I'm Andrew Hill, the FT's Management Editor. As a long-time observer of chief executives, I've always been interested in how leaders behave under pressure. Whether they're rescuing a company, bidding for another or being bid for, launching a new venture, or even facing disgrace, trial and jail. To run an organisation, you need somehow to be able to cope with intense stress. I went to interview four corporate leaders about how they managed, personally and professionally, in the toughest times. I take things non-emotionally and I'm more analytical than emotional. How do you think you would feel if you had a child and everyone said to you, wow, your baby's really ugly? It's about as Kafkaesque as you can get. It's like a terrorist sitting there with a gun to your head. What is it like trying to save a company whose failure could destroy the banking system and shake confidence in the global economy? That was the high-pressure challenge facing Stephen Hester when he was asked to lead the British bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, in the depths of the financial crisis in 2008. Politics and business are uneasy bedfellows, and when they're forced into the same bed for an extended period of time, there's collateral damage on both sides. In 2014, he became chief executive of RSA, where he has also led a turnaround. It is almost never in life that a decision avoided is a problem avoided. I can take pressure as a person. That's one of the attributes, it seems to me, you probably need. Um, uh, and figure out how you behave under pressure. Hester already had a strong reputation as an executive at Credit Suisse First Boston and Abbey National and chief executive of British Land when he joined the board of crippled bank Northern Rock in 2008. That summer, as the crisis came to the boil, Royal Bank of Scotland announced he would become a non-executive. The bank had just revealed one of the biggest losses in UK banking history and within weeks the government was forced to push through an emergency bailout to save the banking system. It was Hester who stepped in as CEO in November. Fast forward to summer of 2008, you were actually on the board of Northern Rock and then obviously on the board at RBS before the crisis really hit there and you took over as CEO. What did you feel you were dealing with there? When I agreed to join RBS as non-executive, which was in the, uh, over the summer, it was clearly a company with some strategic issues and I thought it would be fascinating to be part of trying to deal with them, but there was no sense in which there might be a sort of existential issue. Really the world was experiencing crisis, there were stresses and strains, it, but, but what we went into in October uh, of 2008 was, was just a completely different magnitude. So you, it was like the clouds opening, even though you might have seen them gathering earlier on. The collapse of Lehman Brothers, the subsequent global crisis and the government bailout of RBS had catapulted Hester's predecessor, Fred Goodwin, out of the bank. But the situation was so fluid as to make normal strategic planning impossible. Events were happening so quickly and there was a total impossibility of predicting how far external events would go and therefore what the impact on the institution would be, that um, it was impossible to have a starting plan, although you very quickly had to figure one out and that plan had to be adaptable as more things came to light. And, and so it, it was crisis management, but all crisis management has to get as soon as possible to a route out of the crisis, otherwise, you, frankly, you just go down. Part of what any leader has to do, and especially in uh, challenge situations as that was, is to be the person who gets first to the right answers. Uh, and then works with other people to chart a path to, to implement those answers. RBS was unique in recent corporate history, not only because of the magnitude of its problems, but the number of parties desperate for clarity about its future. The government, which had taken a large stake, regulators, customers, staff and the media. Certainly what made RBS very unusual for business situations like this was the political dimension and by that I mean small p not just parliament and ministers but also you know the Daily Mail and the Sun yes um, all the scrutiny that came uh, with. Uh, and the intensity of the public interest and so the normal rule that you have business problems with business solutions needed to be amended 
politics and business, even small p politics and business, are uneasy bedfellows. And when they're forced into the same bed for an extended period of time, as, as was the case of RBS, you know, there's collateral damage on both sides. Was that political pressure with the small p the something you were prepared for? I mean, you knew the situation to a degree no, you were getting into. I, d- I don't think anyone could have been. First of all, these situations like that occur almost never. I mean, it was the biggest bank in the world and it was collapsing and it could have blown up a bunch of economies along the way. And so, you know, I don't think anyone had been through that situation before in any event. Uh, and secondly, the situation is so fast moving and, and you don't know what the economic damage, which adds to the pressure um, uh, of, the re- of the recession of the crisis was going to be. So uh, I don't think there was a good parallel, which in turn meant that none of us could have a perfect expectation of what it would be like. Hester himself was subject to direct and personal scrutiny from politicians and media of his behaviour, his performance, his family life and even his wardrobe after he was pictured in a tweed shooting waistcoat following one late night round of talks at the UK Treasury. In the case of RBS, although it was a big and complicated set of problems, there were some extra dimensions to the challenge and that was how to deal with parliamentary select committees and how to deal with the Daily Mail when they want to take pictures of your family and and those kind of things. Surely you must rank uh, as the UK's highest paid public servant with a potential remuneration of £9.7 million. Now at a time when the industry has almost totally bailed out by the taxpayer, don't you see that as a legitimate concern for people? Well, I think I've also been uh, quoted as, uh, as saying that if you asked my uh, mother and father about my pay, they would say it's too high as well. So I, uh, I, even when some people close to me have that view of bankers. Was there any point at which you felt that that was distracting you from the turnaround goals? Well, yes, on one level, very distracting, very time consuming. And also these things are sort of a, a big, let's call it monkey on people's back mentally. but for the leader of the organization, they are just simply problems that you have to deal with. There's no, and and uh, the problems only existed because the institution that you were called in to help with was collapsing and needed public support, and so you can't ultimately be resentful. The pressure on the top RBS team was intense, and the risk of being overwhelmed by minor decisions huge. When did the working day start and end? You know, I think it's it's less about hours. Although, I mean, of course, it, it starts, you know, I guess when you wake up because your brain engages and maybe your brain doesn't even disengage when you sleep. But I, I certainly have never felt this is an issue about extra hours. If anything, I think it's almost the other way around, that, that you have to have an ability to detach and switch off at some moments of your private life in order for your decisions to be useful when you're working. And I think it's far better, it's a cliche, but it's far better to make a smaller number of really good decisions than a big number of muddled decisions that aren't the right answer. So how did you switch off around that time? I mean, your, your hobbies and pastimes are pretty well documented over too the well years. Documented. But probably too well documented. How, how did you do it at that time? Because you obviously couldn't go off for a week skiing. I have a very supportive, if you like, family and friend environment. Um, very private uh, and it provides me great solace in addition to some of my pastimes which provide me great solace gardens and uh, you know my dogs and things like that so so I have a good ability to switch off not perfect ability but a good ability to switch off. Did family come under pressure at the time? I know I know that your marriage broke down and during Yeah I mean it was ironically the other way around my marriage was breaking down which added to the pressures (laughs) rather than uh, that way around but you know uh, in a sense, that, that means that you know, I had to pay even more attention to my children and, uh, and friends. As the crisis exposed the wealth gap, attention inevitably focused on what Hester and the RBS bankers were paid. It was the colliding of worlds, because in the business world and the banking world, not just the banking world, the business world, Actually, if anything, the people around RBS were being paid less than they would otherwise have got or were getting or could have got elsewhere. Uh, and yet, in the, in the eye of the public, it was grotesque amounts of money and much more than anyone was happy with. And so that was just a kind of ships passing in the night in value systems, which had to be crunched together and accommodation had to be found. And that was a business challenge uh, to deal with. It makes it more personal because 
the pay bit gets to individuals, it tends to be very focused on individuals, it's focused on me. Um, and when things are personal, you take them more personally than business problems that you can be slightly more objective about. How close did you come to resigning in around that time? Uh, very close, many, many. Well, I don't know about that time, many times. But you know, in the end, I never wanted to value my career on a paycheck and to, if you like, walk out in a petulant huff over money was so far away from any value system uh, that I truthfully had. You know, I never got more than grumping to my friends, my family and my uh, uh, close ones about it because it would have been just such an absurdly self-destructive action. In 2013, Hester was obliged to step down after the government, RBS's majority shareholder, decided a change of leadership was needed. The announcement came only days after an FT interview in which Hester had said, I hate not winning. And then the following week, you had to step down. Did it not win? Yes. <laughs> did it feel like you had lost at that point? Because the turnaround could not be said to have been complete, what you had conceived. I, I think at the time, it felt like a defeat, uh, uh, undoubtedly. Um, uh, and it was a defeat that in some respects was, was merciful because I think we got to a standoff between the worlds of politics and the worlds of business. But at the time, yeah, it, it didn't feel great. How did you cope with the shock, if you like, of being there and then suddenly not being there and not having well, that role? Well, you know, it's, um, it's probably the third time in my life that I've um, lost my job unexpectedly. And uh, none of the times have been fun in a, on a personal basis. But because it's the third time, you learn, you know what, life goes on. You bounce back. You, you tend to succeed in some other ways at different times. Uh, and you go so, skiing. I think that was one thing you did in between. You go skiing, team. yes, do that as well. So uh, it's, if you never put yourself on the line, you don't have those risks, but nor do you have the, the rewards, the non-monetary rewards of accomplishing difficult things, which, which people like me find very rewarding. Hester could have sought an easier next birth, but in early 2014, he took on the chief executive role at Insurer RSA, a company struggling to fill a £200 million black hole in its accounts. He has led a turnaround that has seen the share price recover by a quarter, but turnarounds at RBS and RSA inevitably involve job cuts. How did he handle those decisions? Well, maybe I'm just a sort of horrible, uh, nasty, uh, non-compassionate person. I don't know, hopefully not. I, I think that you have to start off by engaging your, your brain rather than your heart uh, and understand that it is almost never in life that a decision avoided is a problem avoided. So in, in that sense, my brain tells me you have to make those decisions otherwise it's worse for more people if you put it off. My heart tells me that it's miserable on an interpersonal basis when, when you make difficult people decisions, but people bounce back. I have myself, so in the end you've got to do it. Is there a point in your whole career of pressure where, where you had really to use your on-off switch, as you've called it, to avoid being overwhelmed? If there was a professional point, it's, it, it, I suppose it must be associated with moments in the RBS time or, and moments when you had the most intense political and media type scrutinies which were harder things to deal with. But even that said, I, I would say that issues in my personal life I find more intense, positive and negative than anything ever in my business life. You know, my divorce was much worse than anything at RBS. Uh, and the happiness I get from my family today is much better than any professional happiness I've had.